Episode 96, Space Particles Probe Pyramids. And welcome back to another edition of the Syzygy Podcast. My name is Chris Stewart and I'm sitting in the office of Dr. Emily Brunsden. Hi, Emily. How are you doing? Hello. I'm very well. Thank you. Good, good, good. Um, we are going to be talking about something a little bit different today. We, For the last several episodes, we've been doing baby-themed things for the very obvious, at least in this room, reason that... Emily, you're getting closer. Getting closer. How's it going? Still on the inside. Still on the inside, not on the You are still on the outside of your baby, which is which is exciting and really... Oh, we're just next couple of weeks. going to be a big couple of weeks. But we're still waiting. And we went through uh, the birth of the universe and the birth of first stars and the birth of galaxies and stars being born now and baby planets and even baby moons. And that was about as small as we could get on the whole baby yeah. thing. We kind of went from the really big to the really small. And so today we're going to do something a little bit different. Today we're going to talk about, sure, yes, astronomical things, but we're also going to talk about ancient Egyptian things. We've got a story about the overlap of astronomy and cosmic rays and the Great Pyramid in Giza, which really caught my attention the other day and made me smile. So we're going to talk about that a bit today. But before we do, we've got two things we have to do. First of all, last episode, we had to think back what a couple of couple of previous episodes where we'd been talking about the oldest stars, the, the very first stars in the universe, which was what, about episode 93 or something? Yeah, 90, 92. Yeah. 92. Yeah. Uh, and then just a week or two later, the astronomical community went, well, we really should look at this some more then, and went out and found the oldest star that's ever been seen through the process of gravitational lensing. And that was cool. And so we thought we'd, we'd try that again. And having done an episode about the oldest galaxies, the very first galaxies, the astronomical community has, has decided to come through again. And just this week has released uh, a research report on the oldest galaxy ever spotted in the universe. Now, Emily, when we did that, uh, that episode, what was it? We were talking when, about the earliest stars but in that, we were talking about the earliest galaxies that we've seen because, yep. you know, old galaxies have old stars in them. How old, like how long after the Big Bang were those galaxies that we were talking about? Yes, yeah, so if you cast your mind back, there was a series, there was about six galaxies that they were using in that study, which were on a sort of around about 550 million years old as in after the Big Bang. After the Big Bang. And, you know, 550 million years, like that's a long time, but not on the cosmic scale. The, the universe we reckon is 13.8-ish billion years. <laughs> and so that puts it at about 13.3 billion years ago that these galaxies we reckon we've, we've been looking at. We've, that's all, how old they are. This new one that's just been found, which has been named HD1. Surprisingly which is, short. Yeah. Like, they're, oh, this is Galaxy 1 as far as they're concerned. They reckon it's about 13.5 billion years ago, which is only 300 million years after the Big Bang itself, which is staggering. They uh, they spotted it, the, the they being, I don't know, I'm trying to find the researchers here. Don't know. I'll put a link in the show notes. Go and have a look at it. Um, they used 1,200 hours of observing time with Subaru Telescope, Vista Telescope, the UK Infrared Telescope, and the Spitzer Space Telescope, which you were saying it doesn't even run anymore. Well, so. no, it it's, was in the sort of early 2000s. So, right, okay. So yeah. that one's been mothballed. Um, but that's a, like 1,200 hours. Is that a lot? It's a huge amount of <laughs> telescope time. They called in a lot of favours to yeah, do that one. Yeah, man. Yeah. So you should, if you look at your podcast player now, you should see the image um, from from this particular piece of research. And Emily, how would you characterise the image of this galaxy? Does it look like a galaxy? What does it look like? Well, even before I saw your screen this morning, I, I had a go and had, t took a stab. I'm going to guess that this galaxy looks a little bit like a fuzzy blob. Yeah, and if you look at your podcast player now, you will notice that, yep, Emily's absolutely right. It's a fuzzy blob. Fuzzy red blob. I don't know if the red's real, but... Um, well, but it's, it's very red-shifted, I guess. Red yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a fuzzy red blob, 13.5 billion years old. 13.5 billion light years away. So, I don't know, Emily. I reckon we are, without question, setting the agenda 
for global astronomical research right now. That's two for two. I want to say that after today's episode, we're probably going to be, I don't know, leading the way in ancient Egyptian archaeology, I think. Just put put that put a, a a thumbtack in the wall. That one's ours today. Yeah, with that thumbtack, can I burst your bubble a little bit? Yeah, I suspect that a lot of people are publishing stuff about these very early stars and galaxies because we're about to have the best instrument to study these that we've ever even dreamed of uh, yeah, come online. You, you could be right. You could be right. Of course, we're talking about the thing that we've been talking about since it actually got into space, JWST, the James Webb Space Telescope, the just wonderful space telescope. And uh, and it does actually say down the bottom of this article, which is from the BBC that I was reading this morning, um, that uh, that they do actually call out that, yeah, so soon we'll be able to use the James Webb Space Telescope to observe HD1 and uh, and check our figures on its distance from Earth. But Emily, you, you seem to be implying that that there's a bit of a rush on here. Why would astronomers be concerned about JWST coming online? Well, if you've been spending 1,200 hours gathering telescope <laughs> data from around the world for the last numerous years, then you kind of want that out and published so that you have the first go at this kind of discovery, not to get sniped by, you know, James Webb. <laughs> That's, that seems fair. Look, astronomers, I, I think that's reasonable. If you've got a lot of work going on, and JWST could steal your lunch, then get it out there, particularly with something that we've talked about at all within the last, say, 20 episodes of the podcast. There's, I'm, just, I'm not telling you how to do your job. I'm just suggesting that, you know, statistically, you're on to a winner, I think, if you just have a look at what we've talked about over the last couple of months. Anyway, Emily, the second thing is that uh, several episodes ago, we had just a little moment on this podcast where I mentioned the fact that I, I was getting older. I'd had my 50th birthday back in, in December. And uh, and you gave me a birthday present, which I which I got to open on, uh, live on air, live on the podcast. I'm going to throw that one back to you and say, given that we don't know when the last of these podcasts is going to be before we welcome your new arrival... Uh, I've got a little present for you. So I'm just going to hand this across as a little bag exciting. with some stuff inside. Thank you. Wow, we've got a lovely little parcel which is wrapped in safari-themed baby paper. It's a very popular thing with babies, I've noticed. It does seem to be. I don't know if babies have any clue or care in the slightest about safari animals, but... Oh, look at this. This is something we talked about, wasn't it? It is, yes. <laughs> so we got a little baby onesie and a lovely navy blue. With Planck and Planck's cosmic microwave background yes. on it. Emily had mentioned, wouldn't it be great to get the cosmic microwave background on a onesie? And so, well, you know what? I can do that. <laughs> you certainly can. They are going to be super happy. And I hope that they don't, you know, destroy it with their various bodily fluids. Oh, they will. They will. <laughs> very, very cute. They're going to all the best from all of us at Syzygy HQ. Best nerd education me. they could possibly need. Excellent. Thank Perfect. you. Pleasure. But look, enough of that. On to today's topic du jour, which, as I mentioned, is a, is an odd one for us. We haven't really delved into ancient Egyptian archaeology before, but we're going to today because, I mean, who doesn't like pyramids, right? It's, it's such an amazing topic, these ancient structures, um, which are still incredibly mysterious. You know, we know an enormous about them, but we don't, there's an enormous amount that we still don't know about them. And so they're just inherently fascinating things. But the research that I saw indicated that there were a bunch of physicists who were weighing in on the whole pyramid archaeology thing by saying, do you know what? We've got a new way that we could scan the insides of these pyramids. We could find out if there's stuff in there that we haven't seen yet. And the way we're going to do that is by using cosmic rays. And I thought, what? That's insane. You can't do that. So we're going to talk a bit about that today. Emily, had you ever heard of something like this before, using cosmic rays to actually scan things? I hadn't. No, no, I, I'm not. Uh, I'm going to be honest here. I'm going to say that the scientists involved here are largely particle physicists mm -hmm. falling on that kind of side of the line rather than astrophysicists. And uh, my knowledge of particle physics is fairly 
um, <laughs> rudimentary. <laughs> That's all right. I'm always here to excitedly well, jump in it, and fill in the gaps. I'm, I'm hoping you will. Um, so, no, I wasn't really aware of this kind of way of probing. But the great thing is it's not just kind of any old particle physics. It's not just building things to smash together and underground and CERN or something. Boring stuff like that. It's, it does have an astronomical bend. Well, it does. It. it does. I mean, there's nothing new about using particles, beams of particles, beams of something to scan things, right? We do that all the time. I mean, that's what an X-ray is. An X-ray is firing a beam of particles of light, photons, which have enough energy that they're in the what we call the X-ray band. We can't see them, but they do pass through all of the squishy tissue and get blocked by the really dense tissue like bones. And so you can get images of the inside of your body with beams of X-ray photons, beams of particles. Like we've been doing this for a really long time. And you can use all sorts, of, all sorts of other particles to do similar things. But in this case, we're not building a big particle accelerator to do that. We're using ones that come naturally from the sky, which is really cool. So this is going back. This was a, there's a paper which is, well, it's a paper which has come out, but it hasn't been peer-reviewed, published yet. It's, a, it's a, what's called a preprint. It's basically a statement of intent from a bunch of physicists saying, we want to go and scan a bunch of pyramids and we're going to start with the Great Pyramid of Pisa, the, the, um, the Pyramid of Khufu or Cheops, depending on which name you want to go through. Um, the big one that everyone knows. Uh, and we're going to scan that to see if there's stuff inside that we haven't discovered yet. But this actually goes back to a published paper, a published study in 2017. Did you have a look at, at that one? At I all? did, yeah, yeah. And actually, well, even earlier than that, I didn't re realize how long particle physics have been muck particle physicists, sorry, have been mucking around with these things. Because even uh, you can go back to the 1960s and find some very early research in this oh, wow, area. Really? Yeah, I didn't see that. Yeah, of of what they call um, cosmic ray muon tomography. Right. There's a lot to unpack there. Yeah. Cosmic rays muons and tomography. There's a lot in that. I, kn I knew that research into cosmic rays went back a long way. I mean, I, you know, I've spent a lot of time at the University of Sydney and cosmic rays was one of the big things at the University of Sydney back in the sort of 50s and 60s. Uh, all sorts of, you know, ground-based cosmic ray detectors and stuff out the back of the physics department, just on the grass, um, detecting stuff coming from the sky. So I knew that it was a big thing back then. I just didn't know that people had started using it to do stuff. I thought it was mainly, what is this? What is this thing that's coming from the, from the cosmos? Um, let's learn about the processes involved. Don't, didn't know that it had actually bent over yeah. to, let's use it to do stuff. Which makes sense, because every time physicists discover something, they go, what can we use this for? Yeah. Let's probe stuff with it. So that's where we're going today. We're talking about pyramids. We're talking about cosmic rays. We're talking about muons. We're talking about tomography. <laughs> all of that stuff. We're going to unpack it. Let's start with pyramids. Yeah. Were you, were you captivated by pyramids? Oh, as absolutely. A, yeah, I think, um, well, Egyptology in general, when I was a kid, I did, you know, various uh, school projects on different parts of um, ancient Egypt. I was always very upset that uh, in New Zealand that um, Egyptology wasn't sort of part of our history curriculum. What did you learn about in history? In, uh, probably in much more relevant things like New Zealand history, for example. But yeah, I mean, I, I think history in school should be a balance of relevant and important, but also just freaking cool. You know, yeah. <laughs> you can't do history without talking about Egypt, surely. Yeah, I would have preferred it to maybe like the Industrial Revolution in India, yeah. which is, was one of our topics. But, yeah. You know. Oh, well. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a topic which just captures the imagination. I remember hearing about pyramids for the, for the first time, and there were all of these claims made about the Great Pyramids. Things like, there's no way that they could have been constructed to the precision that they were, which have all been completely debunked, right? I, I think it's, we should start this off by saying, most of the mysteries of the pyramids are actually not mysteries, right? They were constructed over long periods of time using huge numbers of people in ways which are very understandable, yeah? yeah? You know, I remember one of the claims was that the blocks that make up the base of the pyramid were so closely aligned and so carefully machined that... There's no way that you could stick a knife between them and there's no way they could have done it at the time. And it's like, 
No, I mean, you, you talk to any Egyptologist, you go and have a look at what's actually going on there. And the middle of the pyramid is basically just a huge pile of rocks. Yeah. Right? They're, they're not, it's not like Lego. <laughs> they haven't been placed together in this incredibly ordered fashion. Around the outside, yes, but the, the middle part of it is just an enormous mound of huge stones. An amazing accomplishment, but there's no big mystery there. So let's start with that. The pyramids are explainable. I think is a reasonable place to yeah, start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we're not going to go down aliens and kind no, of. No, no, no. If you're tuning into this one, hoping that we're going to say, "Yep, it was aliens," and Emily's here to astronomically prove, no, we're not. No. We're not doing that today. We're doing something much more interesting. Um, the pyramid, in particular, that we're talking about today, is the Great Pyramid, the pyramid of pyramid of uh, that has the tomb of the Pharaoh Khufu or Cheops. And if I'm pronouncing those in any way correctly, great. If I'm not, huge apologies to any Egyptologists out there. Can I just say when I first read Cheops or Cheops, my mind didn't actually turn to pyramids. Oh, no? No, there was actually an astronomical telescope called Cheops, Ah. which I instantly had to remember what that was. You had to readjust. (laughs) It's an acronym, of course. Of course it is. And I think it is. I'll tell you what it is because Mm. I think I'm going to come back to this idea of acronyms. Um, So Cheops is... You're not going to like this. <laughs> I get upset at it's, these acronyms. It's uh, characterizing exoplanet satellite. Hang on. Characterizing. The, so, so, Chaops or Cheops? Chaops, let's go with Chaops. C H E O P S. Yes. You are, you just gave me the C, the E, and the S. Well, the H Characterizing is. Characterizing CH, okay. Yeah, yeah. And then Where's the E? E is from the exoplanet. Oh, exoplanets. The X-O O plan- oh, X O planet. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. So we're missing out the X entirely and just yeah. going with the E and the O. P for planets, S for planets. It's for, I, S for satellite, yeah. If it's, I'm not happy. It's not with the best this one. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna be <sighs> honest there. I mean if you're just picking random letters out of the words, then that's just I'm sorry. No, try a little bit harder. Anyway, that's entertaining. I didn't know that. Uh let's go with Chaos. Let's let's adopt that as our as our pronunciation of the of the day. Little bit about the pyramid, okay? We're going back around 4,600 years, right? That's a really long time ago. Okay, not as astronomically. <laughs> All of these things pale in significance to astronomical time frames. But it's a really long time as far as the human Yeah, yeah. Human I wrote I concerned. wrote down 26th century BC and I was like, they've got that wrong. Yeah. 26th no, century BC. That's, that's right. That's, but yeah, no, I've had to sort of think, no, 2,600, yeah, no, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah, which is further BC than we are AD by by like 500 years, which yeah. is staggering. Fun fact, we live closer to the time of pa- Cleopatra than we do to the time of the build, than Cleopatra lived to the timing of the building of the Great Pyramid. Which is nuts. But then as soon as you start playing that game, you know, that's that's really concerning. Like I, I was born closer to the Great Depression in the 1920s than from then to today, which makes me feel physically sick. So <laughs> let's not even start playing that game, okay? No, but, but the other one you can do is that we are closer to Tyrannosaurus Rex than Tyrannosaurus Rex was to Triceratops. Oh. Which is, like, that messes with your brain, yeah, right? Yeah, But that is kind of cool, because Cleopatra is one of your big, like, that's Egypt, right? Yeah. And surely that was all happening in the space of, what, about 20 years? No, thousands of years. Thousands of years. So we're going way back to 4,600 years ago, 2,600-ish BC. And the pharaoh, Khufu, or Cheops, doing that thing that pharaohs do, which is, I want to be remembered when I die and I want to make sure that my soul goes to wherever the soul has to go. And the only way that we can do that is by building the biggest thing that we can possibly build. And that's what they did. This pyramid, which housed the sarcophagus, which had the pharaoh inside it, was built over the course of about 25 to 30 years, we reckon. Because it's a bit hard to tell. We don't have detailed blueprints and timelines here but that's what we reckon by a lot of people I'm yeah guessing. huge numbers of people like thousands and thousands and thousands of let's face it probably slaves it's 230 meters square along the base mm-hmm. so it's really big it's got 2.3 million blocks of rock inside it mostly limestone but a whole pile of like almost a almost a, a million tons of granite in there as well 
Um, there's a 2.3 million blocks, and the, the, the whole thing weighs about 6 million tonnes. That's a lot of rock yeah. for one dude's soul hmm. going to the right place, right? Um, it's about 150 metres tall, or at least it was, because the outside, I mean, it must have looked amazing at the time. The very outer layer was highly polished limestone, so hmm. it would have been gleaming white. Did it used to be really finished. smooth? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, really smooth and polished. And then, of course, over... Four and a half thousand years, or actually probably only over about a couple of thousand years, because all ancient historical records point to all of the outside of it was stripped off pretty early. And in that way that subsequent generations do, they tend to look at really nice things and go, we'll have that. <laughs> you know, so the, all the lovely outside layer was taken off and taken away for other things. Um, and you can only see tiny little bits around the base and at the, at the top on some of the pyramids. Anyway, would have looked amazing. 150 meters tall, which made it... The tallest human-made structure on the planet for 3,600 years, <laughs> right? I mean, that's nuts. Yeah. That's absolutely insane. You don't, you don't even need any other Guinness records, no. do you? It's just... No, no, no. So what I'm saying here is it's big. Yeah. Now, something that big, massive pile of stuff, presumably has things inside it. Now, the easiest way that you could do that is just build a big pile put your pharaoh on the top of it, and then build more pile around that, and that's your pyramid. But they didn't do that. Inside the Great Pyramid, there are three main chambers that we've found. And these have been actually found for, you know, they found very, very long time ago. The main entrance is kind of blocked off by, by big stones, but there's what's called, I think it's called the Thieves' Tunnel or something like that, which has actually been around for huge, huge long periods of time because something as big as a pyramid which it was known kind of had interesting things inside it. People eventually said, well, we're going to dig into this. And so they, did, they dug a tunnel around and found internal structures. So there are three main voids, right? Right down underneath the pyramid, actually below ground level, there's sort of a basement, which is thought maybe that was going to be originally, that was where they were going to put the pharaoh. But it's now just, I don't know what this is, just a basement chamber. Okay, big stuff. long tunnel going down. Well, maybe it, but... they just had some extra stuff that didn't fit in the house, like you know, the garage, just to Could fill be. it up with yeah. your boxes filled with old, old toys or old something. Old paint that yeah. you didn't, you know. Probably use. that's where they put the bikes down yeah. there. Yeah, or the heating. Who knows? So there's that. Further up, there is what is known as the Queen's Chamber, but it wasn't for a queen. This is what they called it because no one knew what this thing was for. So if it's the smaller of the two main ones up in the pyramid, it's probably for the queen, right? Because the bigger one's obviously for the king. But no, actually, it's thought maybe that the queen's chamber was actually a, a halfway house for the pharaoh's soul to kind of hang out in on its hmm. way to wherever it was going. Oh, who a knows? A bit of a rest, yeah. Who knows? Still a bit of a mystery as to what it was for. And then further up, a uh, another larger structure, uh, which is the king's chamber and then there's various passages in between there's one large passage um which sort of stretches down at a really steep angle and so on anyway all of this has been known for a really long time yeah and certainly there's not been any kind of relics and exciting things found in the great pyramid as far as i know because well in terms of actual you, you know you, you think about tutankhamun and that tomb that was a very exceptional kind of we found this as it was yeah like no one had been in there for ages and ages and ages and we're going to open this for the first time and i think i've seen this film isn't that where all the poison darts come out of the wall and the mummies yeah. come out and start killing everyone and no but the, the well the reality part of it <laughs> right. Sorry. is that there are a lot of you know burial relics that were found and it was all very important and exciting and blah, blah, blah. but most of these tombs were all robbed and probably in antiquity and probably i think from some of the things i've read pretty soon after they put all the stuff yeah, in i think so i think so that that you know the pharaoh went all right build this thing put me in there seal it up and i'll be there forever and probably only a few generations later people went yeah, no, nah, I think we're going to go and nab some of that. Thanks. Possibly even earlier, I think, even even within a few couple of decades, yeah. I think people were robbing the stuff. Yeah, it could I have mean, been. To be fair, you know, you have kind of put a big marker here. <laughs> right. Here lies a lot of gold and other cool things that you might want to steal. Yeah, yeah. Now, whatever you do, don't mess with this enormous gleaming pyramid. You know what? I think the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take all the gleaming stuff off the outside of the pyramid and then we're going to come and get the other things as well. I mean, yeah, inside... You know, modern explorers have only found 
various you know interesting things on the walls but but a lot of the stuff that was on the walls like the the um the sort of carvings and things they're all long gone there's a broken empty stone sarcophagus in the king's chamber like there's no there's no pharaoh there anymore there certainly wasn't when uh, when modern explorers went in like it's, it's all long gone but that doesn't mean it's not interesting it's absolutely fascinating trying to reverse engineer how it was made and why it was made the way it was. Like it's a bizarre structure. But I think there's all this sense, and I'm not going to say this is necessarily the archaeologist and Egyptologist sort of sense, but I think this is coming from at least the general public that I think in some ways we were spoilt with Tutankhamun yeah. and his tomb, this finding of this tomb that was you know, still intact, still had everything in it from thousands and thousands of years ago. And there seems to be this still this feeling that if we only just look hard enough, we can find another one of those. We can find something that hasn't been touched, hasn't been robbed, find somebody's tomb somewhere. Yeah, which is where this story kind of comes in because if you run out of pyramids or tombs to go and discover, if you're not, you know, if they're a bit thin on the ground, you kind of glance back at this great pyramid and go, there's a lot of volume in there that we haven't really looked at. If only we could scan that from the outside, you know, kind of do an X-ray of it and see, is there anything that we've missed? Any passages that we just missed the secret door for or something like that? And so that's kind of what's happened. Back in 2017, a bunch of physicists, particle physicists, with a few Egyptologists tacked onto the side to sort of direct them where they might want to go, used this new technique that we're or maybe not so new back to the 60s this technique of taking particles beams of particles which are already coming all the time down from space and passing through stuff to try to scan the inside of these pyramids and in particular the great pyramid and in 2017 and through to 2019 they re- released some research which said there's something there there's something inside the Great Pyramid that we haven't discovered yet. There's a void. Yeah, well, in fact, there's a, there's a missing bit. Yeah, I guess there's a missing bit. Yeah, there's an absence of rock because that's mm. what they can see, right? Rock, rock. There's rock over here. Lots of rock up there. Absence of rock here, right? And if you take you know measurements from various different directions at various different angles, you can kind of go, let's triangulate. It's over here. It's up there. It's through at this angle. And they all converge on this, this one area, which is around 30 metres long several metres, you know, wide and high. In other words, it looks like a big hall or corridor, quite similar to one of the other large voids on the way up to the king's chamber, which is tantalising, right? Like, Mm. that could be amazing. We could find all sorts of new stuff in here. And so that's what's kind of prompted this new paper, which has said, well, it hasn't been peer-reviewed because there's nothing really to review yet. It's kind of a, this is what we want to do. Physicists bringing in more particle detectors to lay all around the outside of the Great Pyramid to look at it from all sorts of different angles to really try to nail down, is there something in there or not? And if there is, what can we learn about it without actually having to dig into it? Yeah, it's all about being non-invasive, which I think is what a lot of modern Egyptology is about, trying not to be so disruptive to the environment because, you know, well, we don't have a great history of, you know, looking after some of these monuments, do we, to be yeah. honest? Let's let's avoid just randomly drilling into the side of this incredible structure while we can. Although, of course, you know that if we can conclusively show through modern particle physics that there's a big void that we haven't seen yet, they're going to go after that void. They're yeah. going to go looking yeah. for it but and But I think they'll digging. do it very, very carefully. One hopes. One hopes, with sort of optical fibres through very small holes Probably, and, and yes, things like that. Yeah. So that's, that's the background. That's the story. And it's fascinating. But from this podcast point of view, we're actually kind of interested in, hang on, what? We're using cosmic rays to look inside pyramids. Let's back up a little bit. Emily... What are cosmic rays? Yeah. What are you I talking mean, about here? Let's let. I mean, I wrote down to just to start my thinking off space particles probe pyramids, and then I thought, 
This doesn't sound like something you're going to find on a proper news <laughs> web- <laughs> website. It's aliens. No, it's not aliens. I mean, are we are we encroaching a little bit on octopuses in space here? I, I don't know. <laughs> um, I've forgotten that. Oh, but good times. No, we're not. No, we're not. We're not. But it is. And um, but it, let's dial it, I guess, round to the kind of astronomical side, mm-hmm. because. That's good because we're only like 35 minutes into the podcast. Yeah. Let's get to some astronomy. I mean, we should have probably headed this up with ah, saying, look, come on. you know, we're not Egyptologists, we're not archaeologists. We're sorry if we say things wrong for those fields, but at least I can be confident about the astronomy part. Yeah, So good. Let's, let's start there. So we, the technique is using what we call cosmic ray muons. Right. Well, cosmic ray muon tomography is the full technique. So let's kind of pull all that apart. So you've got cosmic rays, which are particles from space that we'll have a little look into. And that's all that means, right? Yeah. Cosmic rays, it sounds wild, but it's it just means particles from space coming yeah. through our atmosphere. That's yeah. it. Well, and they don't even have to come through our atmosphere. They're just in space. Right. Cosmic rays okay. in space. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And then they hit our atmosphere and create new particles. And those new particles have these little showers that come down to the surface of the Earth. And it's we're just being, you know, lightly, gently rained on by particles that have been generated in these showers from cosmic rays hitting the atmosphere. And this is happening all the time. All right? the like time. Constantly. This is not something that we need to be alarmed about or worried about. This is just part of what happens being a planet with an atmosphere in the universe. Yeah. yeah. In fact, something like, depending on actually how high you live above sea level, something like between 13 and 25% of the annual dose of radiation that you get just from the background. Just from being around. Just from being a human alive on a planet, which is not dangerous at all. I know <laughs> the radiation is a scary word sometimes, but everyone gets a little dose of radiation every year that's perfectly safe from you know eating bananas and... Getting cosmic rays raining down on just, you. Just being a person. You've got yeah. radioactive stuff inside you right now. I hate to alarm you. Yeah, but if you live quite high altitude, for example, yeah, about a quarter, quarter of your radiation dose in a year comes, just comes from these particles. Right, okay. So that's what it is. But can we delve into that a little bit more? Like, like what is it? Like, well, what are these particles? Yeah, we sort of, it's interesting because we kind of know pretty much what they are most of the time. And we'll come back a circle round to saying, well, where are they coming from? Because mm-hmm. that's also very, very interesting. But okay, so what are they? Mostly protons, let's be honest. So charged particles, the simplest sort of charged, reasonably massive particle is your proton. Or helium nucleus, as astronomers will like to say. Uh, sorry, hydrogen, hydrogen nu- nucleus. Hydrogen nucleus, yeah. Astronomers will say, so hydrogen nuclei. Um, also, a few, quite a few helium nuclei, so that's kind of the next simplest nucleus. So it's a couple get. of protons and a few neutrons. Yep, or an alpha together. particle. Yep, yep. Um, and so it's mostly that, um, and but you do get a few other higher, uh, sort of order nuclei. So things that have just a few more protons, a few more neutrons, lithium, for example, things like that. But just the nuclei, so they're all positively charged particles right um so those now these protons and sort of friends what i found quite interesting is actually you can look at the ratios for example of the uh, hydrogen nuclei to the helium nuclei a very similar ratio to the primordial new um sort of ratio that we thought was kind of around just after the big bang right so so do we interpret from that that the cosmic rays are basically just look We knew that there were protons and we knew that that there were sort of these very light nuclei, the the, the alpha particles and so on, like from the very beginning that there were such things. They've been around in these abundances. And so this is just that. They're still flinging their way through the universe doing what they do. Yeah. Well, of course, the hydrogen nuclei are primordial themselves, so they're coming from the beginning of the universe and probably a large fraction of the helium ones as well. So, yeah. So they're kind of ordinary, everyday particles in a sense they're not okay. really exotic things that you have to go to to cern to to go and discover right i mean the reason you do it at cern is so that you can have a controlled blast of them but you don't have to you can actually study an enormous amount about these things by just just go and stick a detector outside and see cosmic rays hitting the ground yeah the thing that's different about them that you might want to sort of Add than just sort of the general sort of hydrogen, helium, etc. that's kicking around in the universe, is that they do travel at nearly the speed of light. Right. So they're not just wandering around. They're actually flinging themselves at very high speed 
through the atmosphere. Exactly. Yeah. So they're incredibly high energy particles. So that's what makes them really interesting. And I, that's what kind of leads us to why? Like, <laughs> where, where did the energy come from? Why are they so high energy? Well, it's interesting. So we know that we know, we know of sort of we know very well of one source and we have some pretty good ideas of some of the other sources ish kind of i didn't realize actually how much this was kind of debated again it's it's not my field and i don't think about cosmic rays all that often apart from when they sort of come through my detectors and actually cause a bit of trouble in my (laughs) spectra because they come through as kind of these little streaks and okay i gotta get rid of all the cosmic rays out of my ccds well there's some great stories around i mean i think there's there's a a good youtube video that i'll i'll um i'll link to in the in the show notes of like recorded instances of cosmic rays messing up computer systems like a random cosmic ray coming down and flipping a bit in the computer's memory from a zero to a one and that causes for example video games to just suddenly leap in a way like you know a character in a video game to, to leap in a way which that was impossible i just won the game in a way that i shouldn't be allowed to and it's because a cosmic ray that's came through cool. and did something ridiculous that's so it's lovely cool. stories like that yeah now my everyday experience of them is you know with the ccd chip if a cosmic ray goes through it but it it um, it's too much energy and it's dumping it into the too much charge and energy dumping into your pixel and so you just get an oversaturated pixel which right. is a little bit annoying especially mm. if that's exactly where you want to do a piece which of data sod's law from. says is gonna happen anyway, yeah so we do do we do mop them out of our um, astronomical images but anyway so um so we know we know that they come from the sun. Mm-hmm. This is probably kind of one of the main sources. Okay. Now there seems to be a little bit of debate, at least from the few articles that I read, about whether we call these cosmic rays if they're coming from the sun, or we just call them like solar particles, like part of the solar wind. Is that yeah, what we're talking about exactly. Here? Although the high energy ones you're talking about, they've come from um, enormous activity from the sun, so things like coronal mass ejections or big explosions from the surface of the sun right so yeah yeah that seems like the the, the kind of the ordinary ones if you like because we understand sort of solar eruptions they're mostly protons that we're getting from the sun um and they sort of they sit in an energy range of which is kind of in the lower to middle part of the energy range of all the cosmic rays okay you said most are coming from the sun like what kind of proportion well we don't really know okay (laughs) So, well, we, I say most because, well, we, we, we can at least track those ones. We sort of have this kind of, we can link when there's a coronal mass ejection to an increased number in cosmic rays. Uh, and, of course, we can link that, of course, to aurorae as well, which is kind of the same phenomenon as we'll talk about is uh, these causing these particles to change and smash into the atmosphere. Okay. So we've got the solar ones. Now, the truly cosmic ones are actually incredibly interesting uh, because there's an, this huge energy range that you can get. And what we found out is that particularly at the very, very high energy ranges, we're thinking these things don't just come from our solar system. And at the very high end, they probably don't even come from our own galaxy. Right. They've is, come a very long way. Yeah. So there's sort of, I mean, these particles are hard. I mean, it's not, you talk about telescopes and you, we, we're very familiar with this idea of you take a telescope, you scan the sky, you take it pictures and you sort of figure out what's, what those pictures are of. Particles are very hard to localize and figure out what direction they came from. Why is that? What's the problem? So, well, it's because it's not so much about pointing a detector in a particular direction because that detector can detect any angle, if you like, of particles that have hit it. So whilst, yeah, whilst photons have this kind of very, like, you, you know what angle you're pointing at. Often with a particle detector, you, you detect it, but you're not really exactly sure where right. it came from. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the particle, you, you're detecting the particle by the fact that it's bashed into your detector and caused some kind of change. And typically that's, it's, it's you know, knocked into some other atoms or knocked some electrons off or something. And you see it not by the particle itself, but by the subsequent chaos that comes after this highly energetic particle is bashed into your detector. Now, you can get particle tracks through layers of detectors. You can sort of say, oh, it hit this one here and that one there and that one there, and you draw a line through it, and that says, well, it must have come from over there. But I guess from what you're saying, that doesn't give you pinpoint accuracy. It just kind of says, this part of the sky 
over there. It's, yeah, it's kind of a big uncertainty there. And the thing is, with a lot of these particles, is that it's not like a telescope where you've got a tube, and therefore the light doesn't come in the side of the telescope from the tube because the tube blocks the way. Right, right? the tube's there. A lot of these particles are so high energy, they just pass through right. the tube. Yeah. So yeah. they're coming in sideways and on every other angle. But yeah, you can do localization. It's just hard. Um, so Fermi was probably one of the most famous space telescopes that was up there looking at these particles, these cosmic rays, and doing a little bit of localization. But there have been a few studies to say, okay, where are these really, particularly these really high energy ones coming from? And one study that I read, which was quite interesting, from 2017, said actually there's um, there seems to be fewer of these high energy particles coming from the center of our galaxy than if you look in the opposite direction. As in away from the center of the galaxy? Yeah. What, 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 does that mean the center of the galaxy is blocking them? Probably, yeah. In which case they're coming from outside the galaxy and our galaxy is actually blocking them. Like that's a good sign that... If you're looking at the galaxy, you're looking in the wrong place. Exactly. Right. Yeah, they're, they're extra galactic. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So that's kind of one of the hints that we have. But, okay, so we we think that probably most of the extra galactic ones come from supernova explosions. Because mm -hmm. there's a lot of energy in a supernova. You need a lot of energy to yeah. make these these particles because it's not just, yeah, the, as we said, the, the normal sort of hydrogen and helium nuclei that are just kicking around in everyday space. You've got to accelerate these things. And to accelerate them naturally, shall we say, quote unquote, in the universe, you need a lot of energy. And um, the main sort of process that we think these things are accelerated is through something called shock front acceleration. Okay, what's that? Which is quite cool. Um, so basically, when you have an explosion, let's call a supernova, you have different fronts of the shock wave. So you might have the first sort of uh, first front that's coming out, and that might be traveling outwards from the supernova at a few hundred kilometers per second. Mm -hmm. But then you might have the second front that's coming up and that might be roaring up behind it even faster than that. So that might be traveling a thousand kilometers per second, yeah. for example. So you've got these two fronts that are actually the inner ones trying to catch up, if you like, on the outer one. And then if you get a proton or charged particle, that's kind of it ends up bouncing between these two shock fronts. But every time it bounces, of course, the distance is getting shorter and it's getting sort of more energy. It's getting accelerated by the shock front itself. And so it kind of bounce, 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 and then gets a huge amount of energy and off it goes at wow, nearly the speed of light. That's really cool. It's like it's like a natural supernova particle accelerator. That's yeah. awesome. Well, I mean, the universe does have the best particle accelerators well, yeah. that we know of. Yeah. So we're just we're just making inferior copies down here on the ground <laughs> but to be fair you don't really want to go and stick your equipment near no, a supernova do no. you no really? we've already established that that's a bad thing yeah so supernova are definitely um producing cosmic rays we just don't know really exactly what proportion of these ones are being produced um there was a tantalizing hint that maybe some of the radio galaxies might be um producing them as well so we sort of got some data that suggested that maybe uh, one of the local i think it was cygnus uh, sorry not cygnus uh, one of our local radial galaxies um i have to look, look up the name of it actually but um was producing anyway so there were more maybe coming from that part of the sky and radio galaxies the if i remember correctly if something's putting out a lot of radio wave energy radio wave or radio wavelength radiation that's a sign that there's something very energetic happening inside it exactly yeah. yeah so we have these classic radio galaxies which have these enormous jets that go out to the side and those jets are being propelled out by a supermassive black hole in the center and then the jets go out parallel to our line of sight and they're just you know smashing into the intergalactic medium and causing chaos right so again, huge amounts of energy, not so surprising that you might see very energetic things coming out of it. Yeah. And in fact, AGN in general, which are these active galactic nuclei or feeding supermassive black holes at the centers of galaxies, they're kind of like the the top of the the list for the very, very high energy particles. Because again, they're they're super energetic. You get you can get these shock fronts produced as the feeding happens and the jets have got lots of energy and yeah, they're just they're very violent <laughs> places. So it would make sense that they would produce them. But as I say, we're not really exactly sure how much production we of our cosmic rays we're getting sure. from these things. But at least some of those and the and the high energy ones are not coming from our local environment. They're not coming from the sun. They're coming from big energetic things 
stupendously large amounts of energy quite a long way away. Yeah. Right. Okay. But they do reach us yeah. eventually. And there's a lot of them. I mean, there's, this is happening all the time. Yeah. Right. So the thing is, then they get to the Earth and they collide with our atmosphere. And our atmosphere is made up of lots of molecules. So particularly, uh, we have lots of oxygen and lots of nitrogen uh, molecules. And so those are quite sort of big things, I guess, big clunky neutral atoms. Yeah. Just sort of yeah. Lots of protons, lots of neutrons, lots of electrons hanging around. Yeah. And so they get hit by a cosmic ray and it all, it all gets very exciting at this point. <laughs> And this is what you get. I like this term. You get an air shower. Yes, an air shower. Shower of particles. Yeah. I didn't know it was called an air shower, though. Mm. That's quite cool, isn't mm. it? You can just imagine it. You know, you, you, one, your one cosmic ray comes in, it hits your one neutral atom, then a whole bunch of other particles are produced at that point, and they just shower down yeah. onto and, the Earth. Yeah, you know, it's a lot of energy. And so the particles that are produced or bashed out of the atoms or, you know, created out of just the pure energy – They've also got a lot of energy and they can bash into other things. And so yeah. you get this sort of chain reaction of bang, 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 and all sorts of stuff coming down, Yeah, starting from one particle. So you get, I've got a little list here. You can get X-rays, protons, alpha particles, pions, muons, electrons, neutrinos, neutrons, and photons. Right. Well, they're so the most common ones. Anyway. A bunch of those we already know, but there's a few outliers in there that we haven't come across much. So... I mean, we have talked a little bit about muons, I think, on the podcast before, but not terribly much. And what was the other one you said? Um, pions. Pions. Maybe the other one. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, muons. Start with those, remembering my particle physics. A muon is like an electron, only bigger, heavier, more yeah. massive. Yep. Yeah, so exactly the same charge, exactly the same in every other way as an electron, just really big and massive. Hmm. And that's just one of the things that the universe does. It makes copies of things that are bigger. And this is one of those. A pion is something a little bit different. A pion's... So if you look in the nucleus of an atom, and you've got protons and neutrons, protons and neutrons are themselves made up of quarks, or quarks, depending on where you come from. And there's three quarks inside a proton and three quarks inside a neutron, different arrangements and so on. A pion is a bit like that. It's a composite thing, except it's only got two quarks in it, or actually a quark and an anti-quark. And so you can you can stick quarks together in different ways. And one of the ways is with three, and one of them is with a quark and an anti-quark. And that's what a pion is. So it's a perfectly reasonable particle. We just don't see them terribly much because they tend to fall apart. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the muons and the pions. Yeah. And I think most of the other we talked about neutrinos, for example. Yeah, we, we sort of... We know what we're talking about with neutrinos. We've talked about those before. We'll mention them in a little bit anyway. Yeah. So, yeah. So the big thing, of course, is that's interesting here is photons, I think, because photons, this is where the example where you might see aurora form, for example. Right. When lots of um, cosmic rays from the sun, particularly, will hit the atmosphere and you'll get uh, the oxygen and the nitrogen will sort of glow because of the energy that they're re-radiating in the form of photons. Right. Yeah, you get all the... And the, the reason it's up around the poles, the polar regions, is because you've got all of these particles coming from the sun. I mean, that's that's mostly what we're talking about here, isn't it? It's part of the solar wind. And they hit the Earth's magnetic field and kind of spiral down to where the magnetic field sort of enters or exits the planet up around the poles. And so you get this spiraling effect, concentration of energy beautiful bright lights because yeah. of that concentration these amazing green and purple and blue colors mm. which i've never seen i still i still want to see you've you've witnessed I've seen them, the southern you? lights yeah, but not, yeah. not so much the northern lights one day yeah. one yes. day it's on the list <laughs> so these particles will continue pretty much on the same path as the incoming uh cosmic ray so the cosmic right. ray's gone the energy's gone it's dissipated when it's hit this molecule and it's been created into these new things now many of them don't actually reach the ground for a couple of reasons either they hit something else and then you know something else happens and that's a sort of a tertiary reaction and we're not really interested in that right now yeah. um or a lot of these things are very short-lived very short lifetimes so that particularly i think the pions are very short-lived yeah. pions don't stick around terribly long before they decay they fall apart and make yeah. something else so the only things that tend to reach the ground are the photons, obviously, mm -hmm. um, a few electrons and positrons, the muons and neutrinos. Yeah. The muons are interesting in that regard as well, because this has come up on the podcast before. The muons shouldn't reach the ground because they should decay. 
right? Mm. But Einstein steps in and says, well, no, hang on a second. Because they're really energetic and moving really, really quickly, there's a thing called time dilation or length contraction. And when you're traveling at really, really high speed, Einstein's theory of relativity says, you do the calculation, distance and time change. And so from the muon's point of view, the distance down to the ground or the time taken for it to get to the ground is actually changed. The yeah. distance down to the ground is much shorter than we would see it from the from the outside. And so it can reach the ground before it decays, even though it shouldn't. It's wild. It's, <laughs> it's crazy stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, so the average muon should last around 2.2 microseconds, I think it is, which is actually a long time for a particle, I yeah. think. Yeah, moving, moving at high speed, yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's, a, that's a long but time. If you but do... even for any, any sort of strange, weird particle you would normally create in a, in a collision like that, yeah, that yeah. is a long time. But it doesn't sound like long enough for it to go from the atmosphere no, to the ground. No, it shouldn't be. If you just do the measurement, there's no way it should reach the ground. But it does because, thanks, Einstein. Yeah, it's very, very cool. So we'll come back to the muons in a bit. Um, the electrons and positrons, you might have actually seen uh, some of these particles coming down to the ground because these are what we pick up in cloud chambers or oh, bubble chambers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you, you might have seen that at school, for example. Yeah. It's, a, it's a classic sort of particle physics or modern physics, even though it's not particularly modern, <laughs> um, demonstration that you can, you can make just, uh, just in, the, in the laboratory or in the classroom. It's a little bit tricky, but you can do it. A, a little cloud chamber that will show the trails of charged particles traveling through the cloud as a little sort of, you know, woof of cloud as it as it passes through. So you can actually see them, which is really cool. Yeah, you see little tracks and mm. these things. Yeah. So yeah. So those are the ones that you see in those those chambers. Um, and of course, the neutrinos. Um, I think we've mentioned them before, but these neutrinos are just they're just mad particles. They've got almost no mass. Um, and they're traveling so fast, and they just don't see the world as the rest of the world sees yeah. the world. Yeah, they've got almost no mass. They've got no electric charge, so they're not interacting electrically with anything. The only way they interact is through what we call the weak nuclear force, and it's called the weak nuclear force for a reason. It doesn't happen terribly easily. And so huge numbers of neutrinos can just fling themselves through huge amounts of matter like the entire Earth without even noticing. Yeah. They yeah. basically see all empty space. Yeah. yeah. All atoms are empty space. Nothing here to see. But though we do pick those up, of course, in our neutrino detectors. Yeah. So uh, Ice Cube is probably the one I'm most familiar with, which is an Antarctica enormous particle detector, you know, a square kilometre of ice that they're looking in to see the odd neutrino smash into something else. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, neutrino detectors are, did we see one? Mm. You know, did, did we have an event? It's quite, quite amazing stuff. And they're looking for neutrinos that have already gone through the entire Earth. Yeah. So they're yeah. looking for cosmic ray that hits the atmosphere, creates a neutrino, and that neutrino passes through the entirety to the polar opposite <laughs> to side the other of the side of the world. world. Yeah, it's mad, mad stuff. Anyway, so the but what we're carrying on with here, looking at, is the muons. So the muons do reach the ground. Now. Muons are quite interesting, and this is my little learn, but learnt bit of particle physics for the day. Because as I say, it's not my special topic. I'm not going to do a mastermind on it. But um, because they they've got this electric charge, this negative charge, just like an electron, um, but they're quite fat, you know, yep. f- heavy things, big heavy things. So they're very deeply penetrating, comparative to say an electron. So you might get your electrons and protons hitting the ground, but they're not very penetrating they right. can't go through stuff right because they're because they're so light they're really easily shifted around by other charges yeah like electrons are really easily influenced muons not so much yeah so because they have this you have breaking radiation so what happens is when you are a charged particle if you have other charges other ions around you then you're going to interact electromagnetically and one of the ways is through you could decelerate is through bremsstrahlung or breaking radiation now, if you're very light, you're going to be very susceptible to this, and that's why electrons and protons don't do much. They sort of hit the few <laughs> hit the few things and they stop. But muons don't. They just keep on going. Well, at least go for a little while into the ground. You can detect them in mines underneath the Earth's surface, for example. Sure. I mean, they've got because of their mass. It's like it's kind of like a kind of like a large truck versus a, a moped. 
right? They can be going at the same speed, but it's much easier to stop a moped than it is to stop a large truck. Hmm. And it's kind of a similar thing, that the muon will be losing energy because it's interacting with stuff around it, with other charges around it. It's just got a lot more energy that it needs to do. You've got to have a lot more braking going on there to slow the thing down. Yeah. So it's almost in a weird way that because it's bigger, it's harder to stop. Yeah. Um, and that's what makes it useful for tomography. So this is, we say... Okay, so we know how many muons are sort of coming down from the earth, from the atmosphere. In fact, it's something like one going through your hand every second if you sort of hold out your okay. hand to catch muon raindrops, if you like. You'll get one. One go, a second. One a second okay. will go through there. Yeah. So it's a reasonable rate, hmm. right? It's not that you have to hang around and wait for these one-off neutrino events or things like that. Um, and so what you what you do is you stick your thing that you want to measure. Let's say you've got your piece of wood and you want to measure if that piece of wood has a hole hidden in the middle of it right so you stick your piece of wood on top of your detector and on the left hand side of the detector you're getting you know your full rate of muons that have passed through the piece of wood the right hand side you're getting all your full rate of muons that pass through the piece of wood but maybe the muons that are coming through the middle where there might be a hole in your piece of wood these haven't been braked quite as much because they've gone through less wood. Right. So some of the muons going through the two ends of the wood, where there isn't a hole, some of those are being stopped or their energy is being re- reduced. We're seeing an effect there. Whereas in the middle part, we can deduce there must be a hole in there because the muons are coming through with more energy or we're seeing more muons with more energy yeah. coming through. Yeah. Right. So you've so got absorption at the ends and there's sort of a little bit yeah. less absorption at the middle. So you can infer something about what's going on inside your sample, your block of wood in this case, by looking at what are the characteristics of the muons that make it through to our detectors on the other side. Hmm. Right. And that's what tomography is. That's what that word means, right? I'm, I'm not sure what the, the derivation of that word is, but it's graphy is, is measuring, making a map of something, hmm. right? And tomography means creating an image in this way by passing stuff through it and building up information based on what's passed through. So a classic example that you might have come across in hospitals is... PET, PET scanners, positron Mm. emission tomography, where they put stuff inside you that will emit positrons, anti-electrons, anti-particles of electrons, which will fire out of you and hit the detectors all around you. And those detectors, you can work backwards and say, well, they're all coming from this place, so there must be something going on inside there. They can create an image inside you from what's come out of you. Hmm. So we're seeing a similar sort of thing here. Yeah. So if you want to build up kind of a three-dimensional scan, all you've got to do is not just put your um, your detectors underneath the piece of wood. You've got to put them on each side, you know, left-hand side, the right-hand side, the top and the bottom. And then you can actually put all that information together and build a 3D model of your piece of wood with holes in it. Or indeed, your great pyramid. Or your great pyramid. So this is bringing us right back around to ancient Egypt or modern Egypt, trying to learn something about the Great Pyramid of Cheops. Is that what we said it was yeah. going to be? Cheops. Yeah. And so that's what happened. I mean, you, you said that this kind of, this this idea dates back to the 60s, but the paper that, that we, we're sort of leaning on here today, which then leads to this, this very recent one, was in 2017 and then yeah. followed up in 2019, where they did exactly this. They didn't surround the entire pyramid with detectors, but they did have various detectors of various kinds on various sides, on different sides of the of the pyramid, to be able to go, well, what's coming through from this angle? Hmm. And what's coming through from this angle? And, and most of their ones were actually angle? inside as well. So they, That's right. yeah, they put yeah, them yeah. in the chambers and sort of said, well, what are we detecting from above this chamber, for That's example? right. Yeah, I'd forgotten that. So yeah. they got ones around the outside and then loads inside as well. Yeah. And so they're able to, from the data, from all sorts of different angles, kind of piece it all together and go, it all kind of overlaps up here. We're, we're seeing a lack, or sorry, we're seeing more muons with more energy coming through because there seems to be a hole here, you know? And it's it's not a really high detailed scan. It doesn't show you, oh yeah, there's a room. It just says, there's something. There's something here. The way they show it in all the pictures or all the, the sort of the, the graphics that go 
with this research, because they want to make it look as schmick as possible, right? Is there's this sparkly region inside the pyramids. <laughs> Ooh, there's something exciting in it's here. Different in this Give bit. us research funding and we'll go and find what the treasure is. Which is like that's really cool. The fact that you can use particles which are already coming through anyway, and you can just look at them mm. from different angles with the right kind of things and go, we can learn something about what's in the stone above us by what's coming through it. Yeah, and it's totally non-invasive. You know, yeah. you're not adding any particles to the pyramid. They, they're going to go through that pyramid whether or not yes, that's right. you've got a detector there. That's right. It's not like you can turn it on and off. It's just happening yeah. all the time. We're just taking advantage of yeah. that. So that 2016-17 team that was called Scan Pyramids, yep. which was... Okay. Yeah. What do you guys do? We scan pyramids. Oh, yeah. it's in the title. I get the impression that particle physicists are a little bit less... I don't know. Oh, maybe I should say less creative or maybe uh, less wacky than astronomers at naming I think it's probably the, probably the latter. They needed a bit of help there. Yeah. So this new uh, proposal, if you like, to, to carry on this work um, is called Explore the Great Pyramid or EGP. Yeah, look, they need help here. I mean, I get upset at bad acronyms, but at least they're bad acronyms. This is just, what do you guys do? Well, we're going to go and explore the Great Pyramid. Great. You need a name. No, that... That is the name. Yeah. That's what we're calling it. Oh, come project. on. Really? No, it's just, no, it's not as That's catchy, not going to look good on a report. Come on. It's no Tess or, no. you know. No. Or what was it? I mean, it's no Chaos. No. Is it? Hey? Exactly. Not yeah. trying hard enough. So I think they need to, you know, yeah. hook into the astronomical community to help them build bad acronyms. <laughs> they do. <laughs> that at least will say things. <laughs> but acronyms aside... What what are they bringing to the party here? What are they wanting to do? So um, part of the group is led by um, some people at Fermilab, which is uh, obviously a particle physics laboratory. Mm -hmm. And they're basically pushing the technology of muon tomography to the next sort of stage and saying, let's not just, you know, do what's been done before. Let's do it better with better detectors, better sensitivity, better you know, everything, basically. Yep. Bigger, better. Yeah. So they're estimating. So the paper itself, we should explain. The paper, <laughs> it can be hard to understand what this paper means if you're not a scientist <laughs> yes. in the field. What itself. is this thing? It's a, it's a paper that's all about, these are the, this is the um, pathfinder that they've done. So they've built sort of a pathfinder detector. And what they've done to go along with that is uh, a load of um, simulations using the Great Pyramid and saying, if we can be this sensitive with our detection, what's the level that we can expect to scan the right. Great Pyramid with? Which is fine. Yeah, proof of concept. Um, yeah, and the simulations themselves are physically interesting because, you know, of course so this stuff doesn't just apply to the pyramid. It's going to apply no. to loads of different things. No, I mean, this is a classic technique, right? Is if you're coming up with a new system, a new technique, a new something, if you can apply it to something really cool that's going to get a lot of attention that can do wonders for your ability to attract the attention of funding, that kind of thing. If you can say, we can do this with the pyramid and all of these other really important things as well. Yeah. And actually what we really want to do is the important things, but we're going to look at the pyramid because people will notice that. Yeah. I mean, for example, I mean, one of the very early uses of muon tomography was to look at, um, you want to build a tunnel. So what's the structure of the earth above you? You know, yeah, the really sort of holes or weaknesses that you need yeah. to know about, right? Yeah, yeah. So, of course, there's loads of sort of civil applications of this kind of technology. Sure, but, but that's not sexy. No. Building a tunnel for a train is not sexy, whereas untapped treasures in the Great Pyramid... Yeah. No, no. So I think the interesting thing about this being slightly different is that they're really looking to make this 3D. So the new te detectors that they have are a lot bigger than the ones that were looked at using in the previous study in 2017. They're bigger detectors, which means they can't really take them into the pyramid. Right. But the idea is if you put them in, I think they're talking about shipping containers. Mm -hmm. Just a few, have a few shipping containers, stand them around the outside of the pyramid rotate them around so that you get the pyramid from every angle you possibly can then you put all that data together and then you get your lovely 3d scan yeah which is a little bit like those those scanners that you that you go in where you have to lie really still in the in the hospital what are they called the not like the PET MRIs, scans, but MRIs, yeah. right? Where you've got the big drum that basically rotates around you and it's taking measurements from all different directions in order to build up a three-dimensional image of what's going on inside you. Similar kind of thing, just with shipping containers rather than big yeah. rotating gleaming machines. Yeah. yeah, so they do call this a telescope. I think it's 
Hmm. I mean, it's an interesting interpretation of a telescope, a well, particle detector in a shipping container. We've had some pretty weird telescopes over the years, though, so yeah. why not? Yeah, maybe. Not? I mean, um, who am I to say you've not got a telescope? Exactly. Come on. <laughs> if they want to call it a telescope, call it a telescope. Yeah. Um, and they reckon it's going to take something like two years to go sort of scan around with uh, several shipping containers, maybe four or so, mm -hmm. moving around the Great Pyramid. And do they say at all about what? kind of resolution they're going to get. I mean, they're wanting to make sort of 3D images and stuff, but I'm imagining they're probably not going to be able to go, look, there, it's got a thing inside it. It's going to be more like, no, we're pretty sure it's a void. I think there's a hole. There, there probably is a, a number of sort of uh, measurement wise. I, the only thing I read was uh, they're going to be 100 times better than the previous one. Right. Okay. So the previous is... one fairly conclusively, and I say fairly, showed that there was something there. In its sort of sparkly, ooh, it's a, it's a bit of a thing over here. This might go better than that, which is there's a hole there and it's roughly this long and it's roughly these dimensions, but it's undeniably a hole. They might even be able to say it's angled or it's horizontal or it's whatever. Like They, yeah. they could get that kind of resolution. Oh, and it's connected to other things by yeah, these maybe. other little passages and you know bits yeah. that haven't been scanned because yeah. of the way that the previous study worked. So, yeah, it's, I mean, it is exciting. Um, the interview that I read with one of the uh, science teams says, suggests that they have permission from the Egyptian government to do this. What, well, good? Yeah, <laughs> like, I mean... I hope. I mean, oh, it's not invasive, right? Yeah, but I mean, that's already a big hurdle as far as I understand yeah, in terms yeah. of um, you know getting anything done in Egypt um, in terms of archaeology. So you've got to obviously get all your... Uh, D T's crossed and yeah. I's dotted, etc. Don't so want to upset anyone. The problem is that they haven't quite got enough funding, I think, at this point to build the actual detectors that they need. Right. So we probably are looking at a few years away before we see shipping containers spoiling your tourist photos. Of the, well, the but I guess it. hence the news now, right? That this is their way of saying we could do this really cool thing. Just give us some cash. Yeah. Give us a bit of money. We're so close. Exactly. Yeah. You know, we could do this. You publish your proof of concept yeah. and the community says, yeah, that would work. I yeah. can see where you're going. Or some us. crazy rich person who just happens to love pyramids <laughs> says, I'll fund your thing. Yeah. yeah. Let me let me come and push the big buttons. So that's where we're at, I think. Yeah. So you can expect to maybe, I think there's a reasonable chance just on a from looking at this that this would get off the ground. I can see that you wouldn't need an extraordinary amount of funding to make it happen. I it doesn't, it doesn't sound like the biggest experiment in the world. I mean, it's going to cost, you know, it's going to cost a bit. Hmm. Someone's going to have to stump up some dough, but it sounds very doable. Yeah. There's two takes on this that I that I really love. And they're, and they're both from Egyptologists, right? Because archaeologists and Egyptologists don't tend to mix a lot with particle physicists. And there's a bit of a stereotype of physicists generally barging their way into discussions in other disciplines and going, well, you guys don't even know what you're talking about. All you've got to do is this. And it and they actually get, this is get a bit of a bad name for that of just, but it's easy. All you have to do is, and then they make a really simple model and then say that they've basically solved the problem. And so it, it really annoys people. And after the 2017 paper came out, there was a quote from some famous Egyptologists basically saying, they haven't done anything. They haven't contributed anything to Egyptology here. So, well, that's that's a bit rough. I mean, if they do find something new in the Great Pyramid, surely that's something. So, you know, that's number one, is the physicists are ticking off the archaeologists a bit by doing some of this. But the other one I kind of like is, like, the tantalizingness of a big void in the Great Pyramid. Like, there could be a whole room that we've never discovered. There are a few archaeologists putting up their hands going, um... We have looked at, like, there are other pyramids, ones which have fallen apart. Like, we know that other pyramids have voids in them. That's part of the architecture. <laughs> that sometimes in a really big structure like a pyramid, you need to build an empty space so that you don't have too much weight bearing down on the bit that you put the pharaoh in. <laughs> like, we know this. And it could just be that. It could just be a hole with no purpose other than just don't make your pyramid too heavy. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, we shall see. Watch this space. Yeah. There was one article that I thought was just, it was clearly written by a physicist because at the end it's sort of, 
sort of said, well, the Egyptologists, they're going to have to, you know, just put up with the fact that the physicists are coming in and doing all their science and they're going to disrupt all their things and they're not going to like all this newfangled technology and so on. And I sort of I looked at that and I thought, you know what, I think actually I'm not an archaeologist or Egyptologist, obviously, and I don't actually know that many personally either. But I do know enough to say that actually these people are pretty highly qualified scientists in their own right. And the, I, you know, I do listen to other podcasts and things about history and how discoveries are made. And many archaeologists are using top of the range technology to do their studies right i mean even if you go some to something as simple as carbon dating right that's a pretty sophisticated physics yeah. concept yeah only a hundred years ago that was cutting edge physics yeah like we didn't get that at all yeah so you'll find a lot of people who are specialist in that or you find people who do mapping with things like ground penetrating radar or similar technologies or even space um, imaging technologies and so i think the modern archaeology and hence Egyptologist is probably not the kind of bespeckled Lord what's yeah. his face with, who their, is with just... their brush just sort of brushing the dust away from yeah. another hieroglyphic yeah. and going blaming physicists coming in here sticking them actually no there's a lot more collaboration and adoption of whatever useful technology comes along and if this turns out to be another in a long series of that's awesome. Can we talk? Because you're really going to help us do what we do. That's fantastic. Yeah, exactly. As long as everyone respects everyone's expertise in their field. So I would imagine quite a lot of archaeologists are actually pretty much physicists in any way. And just like astronomy will cherry pick parts of new parts of other sciences, particularly physics, but you know, obviously lots of engineering sciences and so on as well. We'll, we'll you know, we'll have it. We'll have some of that. We'll stick that on our next telescope. You know. Every other discipline in the world, I'm sure, but especially ones like archaeology will be doing the same thing, looking over there saying, oh, you've got a new way of doing that. That looks really cool. I could apply that to what I do. So I think there might be a little bit of naivety, perhaps on some of the physicist part of the actual scientific rigor that many archaeologists would apply to these situations. Well, that brings us to the end of another edition of the Syzygy Podcast. A long one today because we had to get through a whole bunch of different topics. We had to do Egyptology, we had to do particle physics, and we had to do both solar and extragalactic astronomy. So we had a lot to cram in today, but I think we've covered the ground pretty well, Emily. Yeah. I mean, let's... Uh, just one last thought on this. Yeah. So let's say you've got... A, one of the most energetic places in the universe, this feeding black hole yep. somewhere in the distant, distant extragalactic universe has created a particle. And that little particle has journeyed all the way across the universe to hit the Earth's atmosphere to produce this muon that's now going to go down into a pyramid. <laughs> through a pyramid. Through a pyramid and sort of tell us whether or not this, there's something exciting to be discovered in the realm of ancient history. I love it. It's bizarre, That's isn't it? That's nuts. That's absolutely... You go back a couple of hundred years and tell someone that, they'll they'll burn you, I think, for being a witch. Yeah. I think that's, that's fabulous. I hadn't really thought of it from that point of view. That's really we've nice. We've got to come up with a new like area. What's this, like, black hole... Uh, <laughs> black hole ancient civilizations yes. or something. Black hole archaeology. I think there's something in there. <laughs> oh, dear. Well, listen, we do need to wrap this one up. But, um, Emily, if people wanted to get in touch with us, particularly sort of ancient historians and Egyptologists who wanted to school us on the correct way of pronouncing the names of pharaohs, how would they get in touch with us? Is there a way? Well, I'm not very good at the phonetic alphabet, but you can always <laughs> shoot one of your attempts at me. Mm -hmm. And that's at our Twitter so we're at Syzygy Pod, S Y Z Y G Y P O D. That's correct. We have that handle elsewhere as well, do we not? We do. We can find it on Instagram. And, well, I guess you, this is a search boxy thing yeah. that you've just got to it's stick the it in. Facebook thing. Yeah. We say this every time. It's, like, it's, just, you know, it's not as easy as just at things. Just go and search for us on Facebook, Syzygy Podcast. Emily, have we got a website? Oh, yes, of course. And I believe that you can actually get your own merch of Baby Grows and you can. carry other cute things with plank on them or with uh, you know Pluto crossed out. That's right. You can get you can get Syzygy or all sorts of other science nerdery merch uh, through our website at syzygy.fm. 
aspects. Along with, there's a contact page there, there's all of the past episodes, and a big thank you to everyone who has supported us. Speaking of supporting us, a couple of ways you could do that. You could head over to patreon.com slash syzygypod, where you can become a financial member of the show. Throw a couple of pounds, a couple of dollars our way every month to help us keep the electrons flowing through this particular recording and help us to do the things that we do out in the live world when that's possible once again but the best way you can support us is by telling everyone you know that the podcast exists go and find that person in your life who's not just a fan of extra galactic astronomy but is also really into pyramids as well and say have you heard episode 96 of the syzygy podcast no well go and do it now that's the best way you can support us go and spread the word help us rise up through the noise emily we need to call it uh, an end to this podcast here today catch up with you in a week or so always assuming that you're not otherwise engaged indeed so might see you in a week but we will have another episode sometime within a week two weeks we'll catch up with you sometime soon everybody see you later emily see you later bye all There's something else in here. Mm. Oh, my goodness. More There's more. One. There's three. My word. Oh, so we got navy blue with plank. Oh, no. We got something else for them to wear. Well, this one's short-sleeved. And we got navy blue with syzygy branding. Got to be on brand. Yes. Podcast merch yes. on a baby. Excellent. We have no shame. No. No. <clears throat> no. So, you know, when we're out in the park and all the... The, the, everyone comes and coos over the baby. They'll be picking up the podcast at exactly. the same time. Exactly. Should we have a little um, side attachment to the pram with the business cards that people can just sort of pick up? Business cards or just a speaker just away. playing our episodes <laughs> on repeat. It, you know what? I'm afraid it has occurred to me that on some of these long nights, if we need the baby to go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Although if it's your voice, I don't know, that could... Uh, I don't know, that, that could trigger something in the baby. It's like, but mum's here somewhere. Why isn't she picking me up? So maybe yeah. different podcasts. Well, or we'll, maybe we'll just edit out all. all the bits with you in it. <laughs> or could be, it could work because mum's near, therefore I'm happy. So it could you be. Know, you know, and try I'm learning it out. more about the universe. Try it out. I think there's a research paper yeah. in this. We've got a yeah. back catalogue of 90-something episodes to work through. So <laughs> we should be <laughs> all right. get you through the first couple of weeks. Wow. Very nice. And three for three. Goodness me. You'll never guess what this one is. Oh, <laughs> more clothes. Well, it's not. It's not blue. It's, it's yellow. Not blue. It's yeah. yellow. <gasps> it is another onesie in yellow with Mercury and Venus and Earth and Mars and Jupiter and Saturn and Uranus and Neptune and Pluto's crossed out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like that design.